Pam, welcome to Power Players. It's been a while since we were hanging out in, I'll say, Cleveland, Ohio at Content Marketing World. Uh, since then, things have been virtual, uh, but the, the name Pam Didner shows up all over <laughs> the, the digital space. You don't need to be at a physical place or on a stage or, or anything. You're a, you know, a thought leader in content marketing and content strategy. You're an author. If there's a file out there on the internet with your name on it, you know I'm swiping it. Uh, you, <laughs> You're so uh, kind. You're so kind. I'm literally just stalking people. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pam, tell me a little bit. What's been going on in your world uh, lately? Oh, yeah. So, what? It has been a year, right? Uh, last time we see each other, probably back in 2019. Um, no, actually 2018, because 20, uh, 2019, that, that is true. And then um, we can then just write COVID. we can just write off the year 2020. We, we literally, you know, I <laughs> 100 percent agree with you. <laughs> uh, it was uh, it was actually a very interesting year, of course, for everyone, every one of us, and uh, not just at the personal level and also at the professional level. And uh, I don't have to say anything about professional level, like how much we're scrambling, trying to work from home, trying to set up our office, all that. At a personal level, um, that was very interesting for me as well, and for a long time. And I get my business through really uh, speaking in conferences, which is more in-person communication. And then after that, of course, COVID, that kind of changed that uh, model a little bit. And I did quite a bit of webinar and uh, during COVID, and I also amp up my email marketing efforts and just try to compensate in terms of, um, you know, how to uh, do content marketing and uh, during COVID. And interesting enough, um, when during the COVID, uh, the first several months, like everybody else, I was freaking out and um, not getting a lot of things in the pipeline. And then things started picking up literally in Q3 and Q4. I ended up having the best year ever. Seriously, yeah. <laughs> it was, that's yeah. ironic. Yeah. But yeah. other than that, everything is good. Everything is good. You know, um, I, we were very, very lucky. We were very careful and nobody got sick in our family. Knock on wood. And uh, here we are. Here we are. And you, you said something that I think many of us saw, which is we were, we were think we were preparing for the worst, but what we got out of it was almost the best, some higher highest performing years in terms of business, because it's almost like the situation where the whole physical world, the, the world of um, in-person immediately went away. We all jumped to digital and right. what fuels that, what powers that is content and a content strategy. And uh, yeah, there's been some uh, B2B SaaS companies, other uh, content uh, and marketing leaders I've talked to that said that made big mistakes in terms of not leaning into it or they were overly, you know, uh, doomsday planning conservative. So they missed out. And so the opposite problem happened, which is they couldn't keep up with all the business they had because it's a really, it's a really hot space right now. I mean, we, yeah. you know, we saw that personally, our Primo's customers have seen that as well. And it's if you could have, if you can make that pivot, if you were the ones who were able to sort of jump on that big wave of um, digital and content, then you did really well. Uh, so. Yeah, but but at the same time, Ed, I can totally understand why some enterprises or company that didn't make that move. And I think there are a couple of reasons. Number one is probably resources and budget. And to make that shift, it does require some uh, effort. I think second thing is um, the also the leverage of the MarTech, which is a marketing technology. And in order to jump on that that you know the bandwagon, you really need to actually have a process in place. For example, you need to actually have uh, uh, the 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 data management system right mm -hmm. to actually manage your content and you also need to have a processes that's in place to actually be able to produce more content is that ability to scale is very critical and i think many companies you know basically at the the, the peace time if you will that they did not make a lot of uh, investments or even transformation to set that up 
And if you don't have that, uh, the, the backend integration, the process readily in place or somehow in place, and then this, you know, uh, pandemic hits, it's very hard to make that pivot. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, it's the foundational layers you hit on data. Do I have all the data I need? I 100% agree. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or um, even assets. Are all the assets in one place that readily available for the team to use to modify and uh, to make changes? So I think a lot of company, including myself, from time to time will scramble. There's a lot of assets, but they are not putting in the right place in the right order or organizing the right way for all the content marketers or even the salespeople to take advantage of. Yeah, the it, it exposed all the fractured content world in some of these enterprises. You've got very content on local drives. You got this content storage place. You've got content in the locked in a channel somewhere. Yeah. So you really can't. So it forced folks to do a content audit. Where's all my content? And then if it's not, if you don't have the data, and if it's not what you're saying, which is that content is centralized. Yeah. You can't scale that. You can't yeah, scale. You cannot move it. Yeah, you cannot move fast. Yeah. That's a great one. And that, so the, there's the data, the content, and then the processes, were, which are also critical. Part of that process is the the mindset of the process. Have you known that folks who, you know who've adopted uh, more agile or uh, faster, uh, less linear, or more test and learn strategies along the way have have been able to um, prosper? Yeah. So it really depends on company. Some company, they kind of lean in and, um, and try to actually create a process to be more, more, uh, agile, but mm -hmm. there are some companies giving that the size of the company and also the different roles and responsibility, how things are divided. They are, they were not able to move that fast. I think um, every single company I have talked to, at least in the tech side and also manufacturing, they all make a lot of effort to move faster than they used to. And uh, that requires um, collaboration and especially in the big team. I know that Aprimo, you guys target your uh, uh, a product actually for enterprises, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, with that being said, market, yeah. the, the enterprises and mid market, 100% agree with you, sorry. And with that being said, giving that the team size um, at a certain organization can be so big and then it will actually, it can be a detrimental to move faster. And the one thing what I have noticed is many of organization kind of activated what I call it huddle meetings and yeah. they have a weekly meeting and uh, especially during the COVID time, it's the first several months, uh, many organizations have the weekly huddle. Right. Mm -hmm. And they have to talk about, all right, we have to kind of change the content on our website. We need to move something. We need to create this. We need to probably change our image. And um, and now people are using, you know, wearing masks. And how do we convey that? Yet at the same time, the images are, you know, still beautiful. So there were a lot of that discussion. And I think for the people to move fast in, in having a process is very important. Another part of it is the communication is having that weekly cuddle, huddle meeting and it needs to be top down driven and driven mm -hmm. by the management. You know, they don't they don't have to like create an agenda. Somebody can put that together, but they need to be part of it to show their presence and their active engagement. Yeah, that that's great. That's almost that's a holistic view of content. Now, there's this idea and when we were in uh, uh, at content marketing world, uh, we spent some time talking about the the content life cycle, this idea of of content from ideation all the way, you know, into that experience world, and then the feedback loop, and everything you're talking about, it's a it's a full circle. Uh, yeah. It's a full circle, yeah. Whether that's you know, evergreen content even needs mm -hmm. to uh, to go full cycle sometimes uh, to get enriched. So, how have you seen have you seen that content life cycle take on new meaning? There's a, a stat from some good research that says. That about 92% of orgs are are in housing their content production processes. Are you seeing that that now I own the full 100% life cycle of content is um, is being more challenging? Um, how has the content life cycle been you know speeding up or evolving uh, in, as of late? 
You know, you brought a very、uh, a couple good point, and、uh, the content life cycle obviously can be very complicated, and depending on、uh, several reasons. Number one is in house versus outsourcing, which is you point out, and、uh, the other one,、uh, from my perspective, is different formats of content. Right?、Uh, are you producing video? Are you producing blog? Are you producing、uh, a podcast?、Um, even just a matter of creative assets, the print ads, and but the the creative will uh, uh, stays the same in multiple different formats.、Um, in terms of a,、uh, the content lifecycle, what I have discovered is every company tend to manage that differently. Have you noticed that Ed, when you talk to your clients, especially、yeah. on the enterprise and the mid companies, and、uh, you brought a very good point in terms of the, the management of a content lifecycle can be determined on the touch point who is actually managing it, and that can be agency versus the in house. You know, I don't see. Much of change in terms of in-house versus outsourced, and、uh, from my perspective, that has a lot to do with、um, the organizational structure and also the mm-hmm. budget. Mm-hmm. And、um, some, from my perspective, I always tell my client: if you want to move fast,、uh, it's actually better to outsource. Because agency can be a whole lot more nimble, or even、right. independent contractor to actually try to create something for you. Because it's under press deadlines, they have to produce in order to get paid. When you move things in house, it tend to move a whole lot slower in terms of decision making process because there's a lot of requests coming from multiple different internal stakeholder, say for creative departments, for the content creators to actually that which is need to prioritize. So what I have noticed is、um, I don't see that many of the people actually move it in house.、Um, maybe my set of、uh, the the customers I talk to is a little bit different than yours. What I have noticed is still a combination of the in house and also outsource. But I have come to realize they seem to follow different content cycle, if you will.、Mm-hmm. That if they outsource the production side of it or even ideation part of it. And、uh, then that part of content lifecycle tend to be taken over or managed by, say, the agency, and they just brought the idea back to the、um, the the customers for them to review. But you are totally right. If they do an in-house, that continuous content development or content cycle becomes very critical. And、uh, internally, the the enterprise、uh, within enterprise, they need to find a way to manage that. And、uh, what I've come to realize on the content lifecycle, they tend to be different, and they tend to don't have one consistent cycle they follow, if you will, Ed. And、um, it, it's multiple different layers of a content cycle, and depending on the format, and also who is doing it. Do you see that at all, or am I just like in a completely different planet? <laughs> no, you're you're on the same planet as me, Pam. No, it's de- if that. I mean, that's what the research said, which is interesting. And I think the idea is every organization needs to think about what's that core competency of the content life cycle that I want to own versus what I want to. Use a third party or consultant for because they may may have deep subject matter expertise. Expertise, yeah. That they can, like you said, speed up、uh, the 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 quality of that content.、Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, but now in so doing, the the process of managing content, not creating another silo, becomes、yeah. even more critical to manage because now you're dealing with content outside potentially the brick and mortar or firewall or. To to manage the complete content lifecycle in maybe even like a hub and spoke fashion, yeah,、uh, becomes even more imperative,、uh, which is great. And then you're hitting on all the content types. I love that. It, there's it's almost like、um, who is it? Anne Handley said, "Content is anything the、uh, the sun can shine its light on."、Uh, so what's what isn't content? Almost、right. is the question anymore. But it's almost like.、Um, All of these content formats, form factors, channels that needs to go into. I've I've heard this term like really surging in the market. I'd like to get your perspective,、uh, and it it goes by a couple different names. The idea of modular content, content. or、um, I have heard micro content, micro contenting.、Yeah. I've heard、uh, atomic content, but it's this idea of content for the the. Creating content for the purposes of reusability, 
yeah. um, improving personalization, making that more effective, syndication, uh, making that more um, able to do, you know, repeatedly and effective. And then um, from there, localization, because there's a high percentage of content that can be reused, but needs to be repurposed and localized. So personalization, uh, syndication, and localization, those have been the, the three big, I'll call it use cases, value propositions for this idea of modular content. Have you heard this concept of modular content uh, in with your clients? Yeah, so a couple of them actually um, brought that up. And um, honestly, and uh, Ed, I would like to hear your perspective in terms of for you talking to your sure. sets of clients, and especially enterprises and mid company, and uh, how successful they are using modular content and also how they use it. And when we, when I have a conversation with my client at a strategic level, if you will, and we were thinking, you know, what is modular content? What is the definition of that? And uh, let me give you a couple examples. You know, the way I see modular content just visually in my mind is basically, all right, I have this piece of content, that piece of content. They are kind of like the different puzzles. And uh, maybe I can take this piece and that piece and that piece, and I can combine them together, create another piece of content, right? So that's what modular mean. And, uh, but then we take down to a next level, right? Now it's like, okay, you know, you take uh, content one, content two, content three, maybe you can create content four. But in reality is, it's not that simple because we might need just a paragraph on content one Mm -hmm. and we need the images from content two, then we probably need a quote from content three. And then one, and then even with that, it required the content marketers creativities and also ability to consolidate and to put that together to create a relevant content for. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Absolutely. So, so all of a sudden, then let's take that down to a next level. Let's assume that's the case. The next level is, okay, how can I really break down the content one, which is being written in a blog post down to kind of like by paragraph. So that's easily being taken from, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And then the content two that assume is an ebook. How do I really break down the pieces that I can take the creative element from content two and on content three, Again, that's to say another PDF file. How do I actually break that down so I can take the quote? You know, and once you break that down to the third level, all of a sudden we kind of got stuck. Well, like, how do we break that finished content? What is that modular of the finished content looks like so we can easily pick that up? And once we start having that conversation, we were like, hmm. This is a whole lot more complex than we imagined in order to do modular in a scalable and autonomous way. Yeah. And then we end up like, okay, this requires a lot of thought. That means we have to buy a new tool. That means we have to do a little research on what tools can actually can support that. And then, then at that point, my client is overwhelmed. So um, this is a little bit more difficult than I think. Why don't we just go back <laughs> and using <laughs> our existing asset management library that yeah. have finished content. And then we have our content marketers manually just copy and paste and do that, you know, kind of like in a labor intensive way. Yeah. And that's, so, I mean, let the technology take away that complexity for sure. That's, I mean, that's yeah, exactly. But the problem is many clients don't even go, don't want to even go through that. Yeah. And they, they were like, oh my God, this is a whole lot more complicated. I don't know what kind of tools we have to use. We probably have to source that tool, right? Pam, Pam, but we don't really have time to do that. So why don't we just go ahead and, and pick on different pieces using our brain to determine what are the content we need to pick and then create another content to do it you know, to, 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 to do it manually. Yeah. So I have not been able to crack that nut when I have that conversation with a couple of my clients take down to a level that have them think through and say, Hey, you know, what? modular content is important. We probably should look into it. And then that should, we should 
source a couple of the option and have a conversation with the vendors in terms of how we can do that. So, yeah. and um, what I try to do is trying to uh, educate them and uh, help them to think that that is important. They need to think that way. And in terms of the modular content moving forward, how to help them to uh, repurpose and also reuse some of the content. And I always try to remind them that, can we talk about this specific initiative during annual planning? Because it does require some thought, it requires some budget, requires to do some research. It's kind of like an initiative of its own. And is it possible that can be discussed as a part of annual planning and then appeal that to the management and take it from there? Yeah. Yeah, you're hitting on it, which is uh, this idea of getting to a modular content strategy in theory it sounds like there, you know, there's a lot of upside to it, but now content strategy uh, in our world, right? We're the technology enabler. Now you have to bring in, are your, do we have APIs that can support yes. uh, the, the, the delivery of the, the modular uh, piece of content, or I've heard content chunks or chunking, and it gets all the way back to how the content piece is stored at its most- um, it, The it's, lowest level. Use, yeah, useful, reusable level with, level with metadata on it and then the ability to syndicate that out uh, effectively through technology. I think if we add that onto the equation, then we can move folks along, along uh, move them forward uh, to go after some of these more emerging strategies. Yeah. You know, at, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, I think it comes back to the source format. And uh, can we actually break down the source format in a way that can be easily accessible and uh, to pick and choose that what we want to use? And uh, unfortunately, I don't think we are there yet. First of all, maybe we are. And um, but um, at least uh, the, with the customers I have talked to, they love, love, love the ideas. And but uh, so far, the, Im the, imp the, the implementation of it is kind of intimidate. Uh, intimidate them. Absolutely. That's awesome, Pam. Let's shift gears a little bit. Let's talk, let's maybe move a little bit away from the technology. Let's talk about being human again. It's been a, a lot of uh, brands with have, have been leaning into tackling, uh, standing with uh, social issues, Yeah. Uh, whether that be uh, equality, equity, justice, uh, out there. And I know you work with a lot of great brands and for some brands to think about that, they know, I'll call it in their heart, they want to do it, but they need to still, the, the brand uh, management aspect is really important. How do you help folks who want to get into topics around social issues uh, move forward uh, on that? You know, um, so when I started um, in the marketing world and um, Obviously, I'm substantially older than you and uh, the others. And there are three topics we don't usually touch, race, politics, and religion, right? Because it's, it's going to kind of raise another layer of a complexity. And do you really, does brand really want to put themselves out there? So when I started uh, as a marketer or in the marketing world, these are the three things we try to stay away. And especially in the B2B world that um, we tend to focus on, you know, our products and also what can we do to serve our customer, uh, our customers better. And, uh, you know, just talking about the products and also how to serve the customer better and also address their pinpointing challenges. There are a wide array of topics that you can talk about with that realm already. And I do agree with you, especially in the past one year, and maybe in the past four years that uh, there's a lot of social uh, inequality and the social issues that really stop bubbling up. And uh, some brands are very passionate and they will, they, they decided, you know, what size they want to take the stand. And um, a lot of the brands are still uh, trailing that water and trying to find that balance. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And that's assumed that uh, they have um, a wider rate of customers and they can be both liberal and conservative. Do you really want to take a view and upset the other? Or do you want to take a stand and just basically say, this is who I am? 
Okay, I want to communicate oh, that out. That's powerful. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that, to be honest with you. And in general, um, for this kind of issues, unless it's very super obvious, right? I mean, you know, racism, racism, you condemn racism, race, racism, like I even talk. And that's very common and you can take a stand on that. But there are some issues, I think a lot of brains are not sure they really want to be very out and talk about it. And um, it had a lot, a lot of time, it's a discussion at the management level. It's not even the CMO discussion or it's not even the marketers discussion. It's the PR discussion also with the legal. Does that make sense? Because if there are certain things, if you talk about it, would that have any kind of a legal ramification? Will you get sued? So at the enterprise and the mid companies, I think there are a lot of um, still internal complexities and, uh, and also management need to weigh in to determine how they want to address that social issues or if they even want to address it. And, but there's one thing that everybody really focus on that tend to address during COVID is safety. You know, how to keep my employees safe? How do I keep my customers safe? How do we provide that safe environment for everybody? I think that is a common things that people tend to talk about. But, uh, you know, but there are some sensitive issues. Um, I think it's really depending on the companies and also it's upper management's call. Yeah. In reality. Yeah. I love what you said there, which is it's almost like the ultimate answer is you have to know who you are. You, the I totally agree. You do. You, and if you don't, and that's what's, that's what's um, uh, truth telling sometimes, which is if you can't, if you don't know, then you need to do some int brand introspection, so to speak, and really get to who are we as a brand. And yeah. then you can take on um, topics like this and move your brand forward. So Pam, you this is- also understand the risks. Yeah. If you do speak up, what are the risks that you will encounter and then be ready for it? Yeah. That's exactly right. Love that. Pam Didner, this is a Primo Power Players. So super happy to have you on the show. Want to end with the secret of your power play. What is Pam Didner's power play? <laughs> I don't even know. You know my magic power, my ninja? You know, I don't know. Um, well, what I try to do um, is just whenever I take on any projects, um, I do what I can to make my uh, my clients look like a rock star. That's, That's awesome. That's my power play. Make my clients look like a rock star. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do the same. Pam, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, it's wonderful to see you again. Same here. Thank you for having me.